Southern Africa is in the throes of a climate crisis. Changes in regional weather patterns, increasing severity and frequency of heat waves and drought, along with unprecedented tropical storms and flooding, have rocked the region. Ten of the hottest years on record have occurred since 2005. The impact is undeniable. Billions of dollars in damage, dying livestock, arable land decimated, and already vulnerable communities being pushed to the brink of famine. We are basically sitting in the midst of a serious climate crisis. The increase in average temperatures projected by mid-century to be around three to five degrees Celsius over the central parts of the country. We've just had one of the worst El Nino droughts in the history of the region. We are facing high extreme climatic events, high climate variability and change. We've had about 40 million people in food stress. And the Sadek region um, it, it is vulnerable um, um, uh, compared to other regions um, across the globe. We've had uh, Cyclone Idai and Kenneth uh, devastating Mozambique. Now that specific track for a tropical cyclone is something that I have never seen in the last 50 or 60 years that those, those kind of systems can be tracked. We're literally facing climate famine conditions. You know, we don't have the luxury of time to wait um, when it comes to these issues. So this is definitely not a task for the faint-hearted. We need to be decisive. Climate extremes in an already water-stressed region are a major impediment to secure food systems in Southern Africa. Along with rapid population growth, urbanization, migration, poverty, and the uneven distribution of resources, the changing climate poses major humanitarian challenges. If you look at our um, um, average annual rainfall, it varies between 440 to 860 millimeters. And South Africa falls amongst the 80 driest countries um, in the world. The climate crisis is really about injustice on those who didn't cause this problem, but yet are facing the greatest harms. What we've seen in the most recent drought is a direct connection between the impact of drought on commercial agriculture, uh, food prices going up, and of course, hunger in our society. The thing in South Africa is large parts of the country, uh, we do have agricultural activity in marginal areas. So the difference between success and failure can be one or two degrees Celsius or just 50 to 100 millimeters. From a food security perspective, if you have a regional drought and you have to import maize suddenly, it has a huge impact on the price. And as soon as we don't produce enough maize, you, see, you sit with a 50% increase in the maize price like we saw in 2015-16 uh, during that drought. And so you, you have a very serious crisis. And in that context, um, worsening climate shocks uh, are just going to exacerbate the lived uh, realities of very poor people in our society. We were supposed to have learned a hard lesson about the drought situation in Cape Town in, in 2015. The unfortunate part is that, I mean, we are losing between 30 to 40 percent of our water resources through water leaks. 54 percent of the South African population does not have access to clean drinking water through a tap. This is what I call the governance drought. Most of our local governments uh, in this country have failed in terms of water provisioning to their citizens. And that is the result of various factors, whether it's corruption, mismanagement, lack of planning, and ultimately collapsing uh, the institutional capacity of various local governments across this country. We have got the responsibility to make sure that, I mean, we manage our resources in a very, very, very sustainable manner. Because if we don't do that, we might run out of water um, in the near future, in, in, especially in different parts of the country, including housing. South Africa is also grappling with the dilemma of its own emissions. With an economy reliant on mining and manufacturing, it ranks 14th in the world and is the top CO2 emitter in Africa. Coal is the backbone of its economy, contributing close to 90% of its electricity generation through its power utility, ESCOM, 
that alone produces 25% of all greenhouse gases emitted on the African continent. There are whole mining towns in provinces um, that are completely dependent on the operation of the coal value chain. There are informal workers and informal working that takes place um, surrounding you know, mines and, and coal fire power stations. And, and these are where complete communities are dependent um, on such activities. So that's why there is so much dependence and that's why communities can't see a future outside of a dependent on coal. So if you look at ESCOM's installed capacity at the moment, it's, it's around 46 gigawatts. We've completed Madupi and we're building Kosile, which will add another eight, nine gigawatts. There's been an over-reliance, um, as well as because of our mineral energy complex. It's over-emphasized um, the need for coal um, to power industries, the need for coal to provide um, energy more broadly. It's a coal-based lock-in uh, that we have in South Africa, which basically impacts our trajectory as a society, even in the midst of uh, the worsening climate crisis. You have all this capital invested, you have all of this uh, infrastructure, et cetera. You have about 80,000 people working uh, in the coal sector and electricity in South Africa. About 88% of our electricity comes from coal. So it's a huge percentage um, and it's, it's very high compared to any other country at the moment, if you look at it. South Africa cannot make the argument that other African governments can make that it is owed a climate debt. It's not, okay, because of our use of coal for over 100 years. Being the highest emitter in Africa, we have a responsibility to play here, to do our part in reducing you know, greenhouse gas emissions in a significant way. So in that part, definitely, we do owe you know, the rest of Africa. Um, so absolutely agree. You know, we, we have some catching up to do. So we know now what the impacts of coal are. Uh, we know the impact on, on social well-being. We know the impact on the environment, uh, on health. So uh, there is a big, big uh, need to move away from coal. The more we use oil, gas and coal in this country and globally, the more deadly the consequences are in terms of climate crisis. Every gram, every ounce, every ton, every megaton is going to make a difference in terms of whether we survive or not as a species. South Africa has begun its transition from fossil fuels to renewables, with ESCOM pursuing a strategy of net zero by 2050. But with rampant unemployment of over 46%, historic inequalities and barriers to economic activity, it cannot be business as usual. What if we get it wrong, what happens with ESCOM? What's happening with ESCOM right now? Where are we right now? You know, we, we're sitting with a fleet of coal-fired power stations that are really struggling operationally. they old, you know, it's like having an old car. The way we have ESCOM now is not the ESCOM of the future. And if we think, you know, it's going to continue this way and we should just status quo, business as usual, stay as we are, that we would survive, we won't. We have a significant opportunity here as, as a country. We have an opportunity to create a new sector, create a completely new value chain. So we have an opportunity here to include people who have never participated in the productive economy. We have the highest youth unemployment in the world. So making sure that we have meaningful jobs for that sector of the, of the economy is extremely important. And then the transition part is we have to look at different ways of doing business. We can't do business the way we've always done business. So getting into partnerships, getting independent power producers involved in the work that we're doing, um, looking at different types of financing models um, in terms of how do we finance this transition given our, our highly indebted situation as well. We can't get the <laughs> The planning for a just transition wrong and, and, and we can't get it wrong in practice. Um, there's, there's too much riding um, on this. I think we're in probably a very opportune moment 
to be able to adapt industries, um, to be able to assist workers uh, to adapt, to be able to assist um, communities to adapt. And I think we should take advantage of those opportunities because I, unfortunately, the, 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 the consequences of not transitioning now and not having the justice element within our transition would be catastrophic and not just for the poor and, and, and the workers, but I think it would be catastrophic for all of us. History has shown that democratic, economic and social transitions in South Africa have not delivered an equitable and ecologically sustainable society. Now, with $8.5 billion of transition funding announced at COP26, South Africa finds itself with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to follow through on its commitments to the Paris Agreement and to all of its people. The opportunity that we have with this financing that was agreed at COP26 is a huge opportunity. The governance around how that money is used, how it's disbursed, how it's managed is of the utmost importance. A lot of South Africa's credibility um, is, is riding on this and exactly on how we treat this money. We do not have a good track record. Having been the first recipient of climate financing and being one of the first countries who are modeling a just transition to a low carbon economy, we owe it to Africa to be able to get this transition right and to meet our developmental imperatives as we transition and to do it well. We are the example for the rest of Africa. And if we don't do this right, what we do in the process is to send a bad message to the rest of the world that we will have squandered our opportunity really to be able to transition. And I don't think that would cast Africa in the best of lights. Despite the concentrations of wealth and wealth inequality, the climate crisis is gonna catch up with everybody, whether you're a wealthy country, whether you're a powerful corporation, whether you're a billionaire, you cannot escape it. My pain is your pain, and your pain is my pain, uh, Angela Davis. And, um, and I think that's the nub of it. It's, it's about solidarity. It's about uh, the intersubjective human experience, uh, where we see beyond um, the multiple layered identities that we all carry. We see in human terms, and ultimately, uh, appreciating that we are social ecological beings, uh, part of nature.